Ladies and gentlemen, welcome to this special interview. Today we have a returning guest to the show, Dave Cullum. Dave is professor of organic chemistry at Cornell University. He can be followed on Twitter at David B. Cullum. And I got to tell you, Dave writes the premier year in review, which is hosted over on Peak Prosperity's website. And I'm pretty sure we can all agree that 2020 was like no other year before. But my goodness, we're only seven days into 2021, and it seems like we jumped out of the frying pan and into the fire. So we're going to pick Dave's brain today and figure out how in the heck we got to this point. And we're also going to talk about prospects going forward. Dave, I'd like to thank you for joining us again on Silver Doctors. <laughs> it's always my pleasure. I don't know how many times we've done it now, but it's it's fun. I enjoy it. It is it is fun. And the circumstances just seem to get dire um with every passing day, Dave. So let's let let's start with what happened kind of yesterday and compare and contrast that to what happened with the George Floyd events because you know, last summer it was all protesters and they were all peaceful protesters. And and I think you had called them like the uh, uh, an unlikely martyr or something like that. But just what are your initial thoughts on what um, evolved yesterday at the Capitol building? Like, is, is Ashley Babbitt, is she going to become some sort of martyr? Um, CNN is blasting this as riots instead of protests. I don't know what your thoughts are on that. And, and just wherever you want to take it, because I think everybody in the nation was shocked yesterday. Day, Dave. Yeah, I think they're overreacting. Um, I don't, I don't, I, don't, I really don't know who Ashley Babbitt is. I haven't had time to figure it out. Um, I was stunned by how pathetic it looked yesterday. Actually, to me, everyone else was hyperbolic, and I'm going, this, this looks like a grassroots music festival to me. Um, Let's go back. Um, you're talking about the spring. I don't want to get that. Your description hung on me. I don't think the protests were peaceful in the spring. I thought they well, were remarkably violent. Right. Um, I meant the, the MSM portrayed them as protests. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, they're idiots. You know, how, you know, you can tell when they're lying because their lips are moving. Um, so what do I think happened yesterday? It's interesting. So, um, so this thing was planned for a long time, and it was supposed to be a big show of support for Trump and possibly, you know, put the scare of fear of God in people's eyes. Say, oh, boy, maybe we better take this seriously. And they got I, I couldn't tell, but I, I saw no footage that showed big crowds. I, I saw what looked like about a thousand to me. Were there more than that? I, I don't know. But um so, so someone came in my office and said, oh, my God, they've taken over the Capitol building and blah, blah, blah. And his head was on fire. And when I finally got around to booting it up, because I didn't even know that, um, it looked like a Comic-Con convention to me. Uh, my first response was, this is pathetic. Therefore, the movement um, from the right to sort of support this cause is over. And, uh, and I saw him in the Capitol building, and, and there was something farcical about it and and i didn't think much beyond that and then of course if you're on social media you start to notice things um they knew these were coming they had more police in the city they could have mobilized um and so the idea that a bunch of guys who look like total goofballs could somehow get into the capitol building sort of defies logic to me and therefore uh my inclination is to think therefore we're misinterpreting what we're seeing and uh my own bias is that they had plenty of time to plan and said, OK, I'm a DNC strategist. I'm a deep state strategist. You know, we got to get Trump out of there. And, and what did yesterday achieve? Well, yesterday achieve ended the movement. Um, it, it's causing people affiliated with Trump to run for the hills. Not everyone, because they've got they've got constituents that they're catering to, too. So some of the guys who have super right wing voting blocks may stay in there because they know they won't get their vote if they don't. But a lot of people are heading for the hills. Um, I didn't see Trump's tweets before they deleted them and gave him a triple whammy probation. So I don't know what he actually said. Looks like Trump can now get booted off Twitter. I didn't think it was even possible. I said, look, there's 70 million people who will be upset if, if he, gets, if he gets, um, gets stuffed. Now I think they've got the moral high ground to do it. So there's a lot of net gain. The DNC has great footage, great talking points. If you look at what happened yesterday, you can explain how it happened pretty trivially. And that is that I have no doubt the cops could have protected that building. Zero doubt. 
If they wanted to bring out force, maybe they could have defended the line against that crowd in particular. It wasn't tear gas, it was nothing. All they had to do was soften the line. They just had to say, okay, let's 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 give them, let's make this a permeable defense. Let's let them by. So, uh, think of it. Here's a metaphor. Just hit me. It's like a, a screen pass, right? So let them run in. Um, and what that achieve, that achieves so much political capital um, by simply making it soft. Now, if you go online, you'll actually see footage that kind of looks like they just kind of stepped back and said, "Have a ball." And there's a video of a cop on the stairwell, and they're all standing at the bottom of the stairwell looking at him, and then he runs up the stairs, and then they follow him. And so, again, wasn't exactly a goal line stand put on yesterday. So if I were the DNC and I wanted to deal with Trump and I wanted to stuff his sorry ass down the memory hole forever, I would have done this. And all, and, and it's not an elaborate conspiracy. All you have to do is say, just let him buy. That's the sole tactical move, is let him buy. Now, the chick who got shot and killed, that's an interesting story. I have a very deep, dark tendency that says, I don't know who she is, until I really know for sure I know who she is. Um, we don't know what that story's about. Um, if I were a deep state PSYOP guy, I'd put a bullet in someone to make sure there was something dramatic. Some guy could just in the crack, pop, crack, out, down she goes, you know, one body. Those guys don't give a damn. And, uh, you know, the Vegas shooting took out 500, and heaven only knows what went on there. So um, so I think yesterday looked like a tactical move to me by the, by the anti-Trump forces. And um, it was too pathetic. It was too weird. It was too easy. And it's interesting because, you know, everybody is like, uh, you know, spurring these different thoughts with what happened yesterday. And yesterday... One of the thoughts that I started thinking about came back to the whole mask issue, Dave, because, you know, now I'm not a chemist. I'm not a scientist. But many years ago, I worked under contract for the CDC on the National STD and HIV hotline. Right. So I know for a fact the CDC would never say for the prevention of STDs and pregnancy, wear a condom with a thousand holes poked in it. So to me, I cannot get this whole mask mandate thing through my head of how a bandana or the surgical masks or anything like that helps in any way. And I get it. They say, well, it's the size of the droplet. But I mean, I've, I've lived 45 years without getting spit in the face too much. Um, so I'm not understanding this mask thing. But then as the events unfolded yesterday, I'm thinking, well, you know what? When you see these air uh, airport confrontations of politicians and stuff, it makes complete sense now that, you know, are they wanting to make sure that, you know, important government officials cannot be recognized in public? And is that where this is going? Or am I off base on my thinking there, Dave? Well, I've actually not heard that one. Um, it allows a lot of people to not be identified, right? Um, the emphasis on wearing a mask, but no emphasis whatsoever on the quality of the mask tells you that in some sense it's a compliance issue, not an actual efficacy issue, mm -hmm. right? If masks really mattered, they'd be going, you got to have an N95. Mm -hmm. No, exactly. it doesn't. You can wear goddamn doilies on your face for all anyone cares. And so... Um, the best way to understand the role of masks, I think, is that I think in the near term, close range, a mask will protect, will provide protection. But a, a disease and a pandemic are two different things. And so um, there are many, many case studies from pre-COVID that showed where they asked the question, should people mask up for a flu pandemic, for example? And their conclusion was they found no statistical evidence that masking actually in any way significantly altered the pandemic. And the, the metaphor I use is that, you know, if you put a bunch of stones in a stream, uh, you will impede the water flow, right? That's kind of the partially permeable mask model. At the end of the day, the same amount of water got downstream. And so I think what you can do is alter the time course of a pandemic without actually, you can flatten the curve, you can alter the curve, but you can't, you can't necessarily decrease the integration under the curve. And if you want to stall it thinking of vaccines coming, then, then, that, then I, I can entertain that idea. Say, look, if it's going to have to play out, I think it's got to run its course, sort of like let the fever burn itself out. Um, if you're stalling for a vaccine, that's different. The problem is, is that when they started making us mask up to holy hell big time, um, the odds of a vaccine were terrible. So it was, it was like drawing on an inside straight. 
So the smart move, in my opinion, the, 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 the Texas Hold'em move would have been to just say, look, we got to move on. We can't stop this thing. We got to learn to live with it. And you know, I don't have a problem with being told to mask up, but you know, you can't come from Massachusetts to New York if you don't have a COVID test without getting risk of a fifteen thousand dollar fine. Please explain to me how somehow in Massachusetts you're okay, but as soon as you step over the New York border, it's not like you know. If this was Hawaii, I would get it. They go, look, we can actually keep it off this goddamn island if we do it right. I get that, although that means when it makes another round, it's going to find Hawaii eventually. Yeah. Um, and, and so, it's just so ridiculous, just, Dave, because so like, 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 what about people who live on the border, right, of a state, right? Some people live like on the border of Michigan and Ohio and cross state lines to work every single day. So, so I mean, how do people who legally can't walk to the edge of their property without getting a without getting a, um, a, a COVID test legally? There are people who straddle the state. and so. But there's, I can't come up with a model that says why coming from Massachusetts to New York or vice versa requires, requires all these details. And why um, you find me $15,000, I'm going to be tempted to find a way to get a piece of that out of your ass. That's, that's what I'm telling you. I, I, I don't, I, the guy downtown who has a diner says he can be fined 1500 bucks if we stand up without putting our mask on. I said, well, I said, look, if I ever did that, I'd pay the fine for you. But, 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 but it reminds me of those five hundred dollars speeding tickets in New York, where it's one thing for me to get, it's another thing for some waitress to get it. They're taking food right off her table by finding her five hundred. By they're taking, they're taking money right off that guy's table at home by by finding him fifteen hundred bucks because someone stood up without a mask. This is authoritarianism. This is and. Uh, I don't think I'm being hyperbolic. I, I just I think we've gone off the rails, and I think it's going to be hard to unwind it. And I'm getting more and more defiant uh, as this goes on. They said you know a couple of weeks turned into a year, turned into um, forever, turned into the Great Reset, turned into you know it's just. And what bothers me is everyone's compliant. That, that I, I would like to see. That's why I'd like to see rioting in the streets, saying no more fucking mess. I would agree with that. I would agree with everything you said there. And it, to me, it's just been totally politicized, and I'm trying to figure out why. And, and, and I think the heavy hand of authoritarianism is very valid points there. Um, shifting here to uh, uh, markets and investing. Um, you know, I know you're a gold bug, and you have a heavy percentage of your portfolio in gold. You also have some silver. You know, like I said, I'm not a scientist, Dave. I'm not, I'm not the sharpest light bulb in the shed. But, uh, uh, you know, the planets have come and gone, right? We've, we've, I don't even know what the planets are nowadays, right? And, and there's a periodic table of elements. And I don't know all of the elements, but I know that silver's on there. And I know that gold's on there. And, and I know that copper's on there. But, you know, I don't see Bitcoin on there, Dave. So, so like, what exactly is Bitcoin from a scientist's point of view? You know, because people say, well, you just don't get it, you know, or have you ever heard of this thing called Moore's Law? And, I mean, yeah, we've been making three gigahertz processors for 20 years and 500, 5,400 RPM mechanical hard drives for even longer than that, right? We're kind of at, like, peak computer technology, like peak automobile technology and things like that. So just in this whole investing world with Bitcoin taken off by a storm, you know, I have a feeling that they're letting it happen for possibly because of the silver market. But what, what are your thoughts on Bitcoin investing in general and gold and silver right now? Um, I'm sympathetic to the emotions of the hodlers, right? I think I think they've got the right idea trying to protect themselves against, you know, government sponsored currencies. If, if I had to sort of Bitcoin has risks that have always kept me from getting interested in it. Um, one of them being is there's a lot of them. So how do you know you bought the right one? Now, Bitcoin right now has the lead, but what was the leading car makers and, you know, where are they now and stuff like that? Um, so I don't know if Bitcoin can keep the lead. It's kind of clunky is my understanding. There's something clunky about it. It's very expensive to mine it, um, which may be good, right? It's expensive to mine gold too. Um, uh, I think if Bitcoin ever achieves what the hodlers want to achieve, it will threaten the sovereign states, and the sovereign states will then squish it like a bug. And they say it won't. They won't. And and I'm getting a mixed message. Some say they can't, and I say yes, they can. They can squash anything. 
Mm -hmm. And uh, all I have to do is tax the crap out of it, make it illegal, and, and it, it'll become a black market token, right? We have checks for that. We can write bank checks. Um, and, uh, and I think that it's also possible they're kind of softening our thinking towards a digital currency, which then turns it into a, 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 a play on, in the war on cash. Right? It could be a battleground where they're trying to get people used to the idea of a digital currency so that when they say, OK, now we're going digital. Um, and that then all of a sudden Bitcoin says, we don't need you anymore. Right. You're, you guys are gone. We're going to outlaw you. And now we're going to whenever the central banks say we're going to have a digital currency, I go, it's not a crypto. I guarantee you it's not a crypto. And um, so I could imagine there's a reason why Bitcoin's running is kind of a beta test for for a much more nefarious group than the hodlers. Uh, I, I could be wrong, so I try not to get cocky, arrogant in that view, so I don't harass the hodlers, and they're always trying to get me to buy it. I said, look, I, it's just not in my DNA. Um, gold, I'll take the 5,000 years of, of history for the gold. Um, and I could be an antiquated thinker, right? It could be the future's Bitcoin. I can't rule it out. It's going to be epic if that's true. Bill Fleckenstein described it as the purest commodity play. So it's like a commodity without the ugliness of pork bellies, right? And, uh, and that may be, but the commodity market is this profoundly speculative market. So if it stays speculative at some point, I think it fries itself. There's a, there's a rumor going around right now that I've, it's gotten sent to me several times um, that to do Bitcoin transaction, there's some sort of reserve mechanism involved, like reserve fractional, fractional reserve banking. <clears throat> something about Tether. The, the hodlers who are listening are going to go, holy shit, this guy knows nothing. That, I, I keep getting asked questions about Bitcoin. I'm not the one out there barking about Bitcoin. But the claim is that the reserve mechanism is super flawed. And that if, there, if there's a big sell now, that it could really, it, you could go bidless very easily. And I don't know what to make of that. That could be just a, someone trying to short Bitcoin. I don't know. Mm -hmm. Very interesting. And, um, you know, one of the reasons I wanted to talk about Bitcoin is is to lead into an inflation, you know, and it's amazing to me the inflation deflation debate is still going on. But, you know, we've got the supply chain disruptions that have been going on all year that we were told are temporary and that are still going on and look like they're going to continue to go on for the foreseeable future. We got commodities, right? Copper's breaking out, agricultural products, food price inflation. We got the yield on the 10-year note is spiking. We've got crude oil poking its head above $50. So, you know, consumer price inflation is all around us. And then now this whole cryptoverse, this whole cryptocurrency universe, I mean, that is siphoning and using up major, major, major technological components as far as like graphics cards, processors, RAM, hard drive space, this and that. So that is also, in my opinion, highly inflationary. And we see this when, you know, you want to buy an Xbox or a graphics card and you have to go on eBay to buy it and you have to pay over two times the retail price because it's not available at any retailers. Um, so so what are your thoughts on inflation and um, what is your just outlook for inflation moving forward here in 2021? Well, I think the reason the inflation deflation debate rages on is because inflation is not some homogeneous concept. And so I think inflation and deflation can coexist quite a bit. So for every, um, you know, sort of inflated c consumer price, I can point to the rents in San Francisco dropping by almost 30 percent in one year, which which, by the way, you know, when, you know, um, Landlords, the, the big developers, they they're, they're always leveraged, right? They, every building is on is a debt, and every building is paying the monthly payments with the revenue stream. And as soon as they build up some more, they take on some more debt, right? The the whole thing is a big leveraged operation. Um, I don't think that many buildings are actually owned. I think they're they're all bank owned at some level. And I think they maybe worry about whether the value of the building drops, but I don't think any of them pondered the possibility that they could lose 30% of their rent revenue and, and possibly more because of empty units in one year. So I, I think we're about to have a collapsing commercial mortgage-backed security market. And right now they've been holding it back because they're simply not letting it collapse, right? Like back in 0809, 
mortgage-backed securities didn't default simply because they declared they were not going to default. They just they you know use regulatory forbearance basically to prevent them from defaulting. They'll do that, but at some point you have a loan that's backed by nothing, and at some point that's got to go somewhere. And uh, so that's kind of deflationary, right? So if the bubble bursts, that'll be deflationary. Uh, crypto is inflationary to the extent also that where there is currently a trillion dollars worth of crypto, there was not a trillion dollars. And that didn't, cons besides the electronics you talk about, that didn't consume any. Dollars didn't become crypto. Crypto is overlaid. So, it's a, so it's a, to the extent crypto is money-like, there's now a trillion additional dollar equivalents worth of money-like. And if, if the crypto market cap goes to two trillion, then there's even more money-like stuff. And, the shadow banking system's highly inflationary because because there's all sorts of leverage built into that. And so, um, I, I think the question is is when does the Fed lose control of the system? And I had a very curious discussion yesterday. I got a call from uh, this is actually rather stunning to me. Guy Adami from CNBC, Fast Money fame. He's a real smart guy. For an hour and a half, we talked about the system, and what really comes comes through in our discussions, we agree. And the system seems so top heavy and so unstable. And at some point there will be the vibration that'll get it rolling and COVID looked like it. And you know, six trillion dollars later they stopped it. But then can you keep doing that? I don't I don't think so. Um, mm -hmm. and that's very interesting that you're talking about top heavy because that's actually the next subject that i wanted to get into with you is just like systemic collapse in general dave because like you see it from the university side of things but we could also talk about it from like the healthcare side of things where you know you've just got so much regulatory compliance and you've got so much administration bloat for lack of a better word but you have so few professors and so few doctors and the people that are actually on the front line rendering the actual service so, you know, how, how do the, does the education system in general, like the higher education system or the healthcare system or something like that, is it not also just super top heavy right now? And is there a risk for systemic collapse there? Like my understanding is that registrations are down in college campuses around the country. And, you know, are they really going to be paying those inflated prices with um, Zoom classes, remote learning only? That's point number one. And then point number two is, you know, when you get down to it, what about all that student debt, too? And now they're talking about a student debt jubilee. So just just what are the risks for like like the education system, for example? Are we about to see a collapse of higher education, Dave? I, you know, I don't know. I um, Again, I was talking to a guy who was the facility head of a small college near here. And I thought they were probably insolvent. And he said, no, we're actually rolling in money right now. So they, they jammed a lot of money into the system. So the COVID money... The bailout money provided a lot of support to colleges to bridge that gap, apparently. Uh, our our uh, registration for the fall was 95% the norm. We thought it could drop more, and I think we were surprised how many people showed up um, for various kinds of online and in-class sort of. We're, but we're still teaching it at one-sixth the density in the lecture room. So if you were in a lecture room, you'd see people spaced out like... Uh, like you wouldn't believe. I uh, don't know how long that's going to go on. Um, it's not a very good education, in my opinion. It's, it's, they're, 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 the kids hate it. So one thing it's done is resolve the debate about the massive online lectures, whether or not they were going to kick it, you know, eliminate all the normal lecturing. I, I, think, I think generally they're hated. And so I don't think, I think we tested that model and it's not popular. Now, uh, I know elsewhere in society, the Zoom model is going to supersede a lot of stuff, you know, conference calls and, you know, online. How, are you going to fly a bunch of execs to New York for a meeting? No, never again. So I think the commercial airline industry problem is going to be huge. And it's going to show up everywhere. So we're going to have to reinvent society now a little bit, um, reinvent cities. But colleges, interesting question. If, if there's a, a collapse, it'll be an erosion from the bottom. So you got some, I don't know, 8,500 colleges, I'm just guessing. It's somewhere in the either 55 or 85, I can't remember, it doesn't matter. Uh, certainly there are colleges that are always on the edge 
and they generally cater to a relatively low quality student and their admissions accept rates are you know 97 percent if you can write the check you get to come i gotta figure they're gonna fall off the cliff first um i i don't think you'll see princeton heading to to to, to bankruptcy court and so i think we'll we'll kick out the bottom uh, the other thing that will happen on a college in my opinion if if, co- if, the, if we don't end up with some sort of fairly left-leaning system where everyone just gets to go for free um, I think we'll see a, a, a precipitous drop in, in majors that that you can't pay off the bills with. So, you know, if you come to Cornell, great education. I think it's a fantastic place. If you come to Cornell major in sociology, you might have a bit of a problem on your hands. And, uh, and it depends what you do with yourself, right? It's really up to you. But uh, I'd rather graduate with a degree in robotics. And uh, so we can see a shift to pragmatism. We can see people saying, look, we're spending, uh, I'm talking to a guy who said he's got three kids in college, 75000 a piece. Those kids better be studying. <laughs> Those kids better be working. They better be working towards, towards a degree that, that extinguishes the debt. And in the olden days, I think we had philosophy and sociology, all these majors, back when college was for the elite. So the elites, kids could study whatever the hell they wanted because they were not worried so much about this. But if you're going into debt, I think you're going to be picking and choosing more carefully. Very interesting. And what about the quality of the learning this year? Because like I look at my own kids and they're not college, it's just junior high and high school, but they've been like in this online stuff for most of the year and they're still on it right now. And it's like, you know, it's a few hours a day. They log into Zoom. They never have homework. It's like, I don't even think they're learning anything right now at all in the schools. I mean, I don't understand how just a few hours of, you know, rote memorization is helping anything. So are we like falling further behind on the education curve when compared to like other developed first world nations here? Well, they're probably suffering too, right? <laughs> so they probably say, here's it. I talked yesterday to one of my former students who's in a highly recognizable big cap pharma company who shall not be named because if I do name it, then you'll, then, then they'll know who it is. <laughs> and, uh, but he said that, you know, they, he, he's been working from home since the spring and he can do what he does at home. And he says he's working hard actually. So, so it's working for him, but he says there's, they're on a 50% occupancy rotation. There's week on week off. This is a major pharma he said the evidence he sees is that the people who are doing that, there's a tremendous percentage who are kind of working for a week and vacationing for a week. And so I think it, I think our per capita productivity is probably hurtling to the earth a little bit. We might be gaining by efficiency of Zoom and not putting people on planes, but we're losing it again by, I can even see it among, I have colleagues who are, who are eye of the tiger intense characters. And then they had to, to shelter and then they were told they could come back. I think I detect a kind of a listlessness amongst these guys who, who never once, you know, Americans are famous for not sleeping enough and working too much. We might've nuked that. I don't if that could be argued to be a plus or a minus, but if, if, if we've got people who all of a sudden say, you know, I, I enjoy sitting on my deck and drinking a glass of wine and not working, right? That's, that's going to have an effect, and I don't quite know what that effect will be. Mm-hmm. But I came to um, work this morning at 9.30, for example. I didn't used to go to work at 9.30. You used to be at the crack of dawn, and you probably swam some laps in the pool before you even no, go out No, no, <laughs> I've been pretty pathetic about that, actually. Um, now, so, so, you know, everybody assumes that this is all headed towards the Great Reset. So I know you've got some opinions on that. So talk to us about the Great Reset. Um, Because it seems to me that hyperinflation is the path of least resistance. So when we talk about, you know, commercial real estate plunging or the stock market plunging or this or that, I mean, they can always throw money at this because that is the way that everybody gets paid and promises are kept, right? Um, so, 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 so ultimately leading towards that great reset. So just, just what are your thoughts on the great reset and the path that we're on currently? Well, I, I don't know what it is. I actually just yesterday started, I listen, I use audiobooks. So when I'm in the car, driving to work, driving to the, the grocery store, whatever, if, I, if I'm driving someplace distant, which almost never happens now, I used to do consulting trips and stuff, and those are gone. 
Uh, I listen to audiobooks. Uh, I recommend it highly. If you've never done it, do it. Quit shut down NPR and put on an audiobook. Nonfiction, you will be. I, I, I could be. I'm pretty good at Jeopardy now. Um, I uh, I just started listening to the book by Klaus Schwab, who's that guy who looks like he's out of Doctor Strange Love, who who's a World Economic Forum guy, you know, Davosian type. Um, when you listen to him, you go, God, I think the Fourth Reich has arrived here or something. So you, you're really left creeped out by old Klaus. And I'm, li I'm listening to the book to try to figure out the sort of the platitudes that they're hurling at us. So I've seen some of them, but I'm, I'm trying to get a full platter of platitudes. So I know what their claim is. Um, if your listeners haven't seen this, there's a 90 second short from the World Economic Forum, which again, these are the, this is sort of the global elite if I understand it, although there could be another layer of none of us see, right? The, this could even be a front to something higher up the chain. I know I sound like a whack job. Um, that's because I'm a whack job. Um, the World Economic Forum has this 90 second short and it starts out, the first thing shows a picture of a guy looking happy and it says, by 2030, um, you won't own anything. I go, oh, red flag. It says, the next scene is, and it says, you'll be happy still. I'm going, I don't think so. Um, the next scene is, it says, you will rent everything and it will be delivered by a drone. So in the scene, they mix in cool to make you think, oh, that's good, with really scary shit. And so I'm going, uh, we're renting. Okay, who's our landlord here? Right? This sounds awfully oligarchy flavored to me. And then they go a little deeper and they show a, a, a heart being um, 3D, 3D printed. And you go, okay, so they're mixing in the cool stuff. And then they go, you won't eat much meat. And they said, you'll have it, but only as a treat. And I'm going, so they're telling me what I'm going to get to eat. They talk about it being for the climate. And then they start talking about trading climate credits and about how it's good because that'll knock fossil fuels out of the game. And, I, and I'm going, this is New World Order shit they're shoving at us. They're trying to sugarcoat it, and it, it's very creepy. And then the question is, why are we getting this? And that, 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 that is the great reset. Um, but they're, they're presenting it to us in an intractable way. That, that we're, They're trying to acclimate us to the idea of one in the most uh, digestible manner possible. I think buried in that is, um, oh, they also in the same video says the United States will not be the dominant superpower. Now, I understand why everyone else in the world would like that sort of, but that's like the Vandals and the Ostrogoths and Visigoths telling Rome, you're not going to be the superpower. At that point, I think the Roman legions start heading out there to kick some ass, right? So that sounds like fighting words to me. Um, I think they are setting us up for digital currencies, not Bitcoin digital, but, you know, no cash. A cashless society is a, is a serious loss in liberties. You, I'm sure you agree with that. Everyone should fight cashless society. Once it's cashless and the banks have the money and they can say, look, we're taking 10% of your money, you have no say. You have no way to hide. You have nothing you can do about it. So you don't want cashless. Cashless is like the 500-hour cap on a $2 blackjack table. It provides a wall that protects you. And, um, and so I don't know what the reset is. I was supposed to have a conference call with Steve Hankey, who's a global currency expert and supposedly a, a political guru. And he said he promised he would lay out what the Great Reset means. And it was clear he thinks it's bad from his from what he did say. Then he had to cancel, and then he had, but he in an email recently said, "No, we're gonna do it. I haven't I haven't forgotten you." And so, um, so I'm hoping this year I'm gonna try to figure out the Great Reset. But it's I don't think it's good. Here, how's that? I don't think it's good. I don't think it's good either. And it's kind of almost like it's a race against time where it's like, are they going to be able to implement this before just the whole thing falls apart into a pile of decentralized hot mess? Um, well, Chris Martinson presented an interesting idea. He thinks that maybe the elites know. I hate the word elite because it, it sounds too spooky, but it's the, it's we all know what we're talking about. Um, the, 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 the elites know that we don't have that many resources left, right? That they can see the end in sight. Um, 
I read a paper on climate change, from a, a, a review of the known literature from 1984 done internally by Exxon that got leaked. They said, oh, Exxon knows there's global warming. I read it. I'm going, no, it was actually just, it was just a summary of the literature. That's all it was. It was very well done, actually. But in it, there was a statement that said that it's unlikely this will occur before we run out of oil. And that's the first time I've ever seen a major oil company say that we could run out of oil. And now you got British Petroleum saying beyond oil is a catchphrase, but they're just kissing ass. They're just, they're just virtue signaling. Um, but it is a finite orb, and I do think that it's getting harder and harder to get fossil fuel. So maybe the elites say, look, it's a harsh reality. We can't keep going in this direction. So far, so far I can't disagree. And maybe that we have to find some way to shrink the footprint. And I'm not sure I want my chain yanked as hard as they intend to yank it, but maybe they're just trying to keep the world from going into chaos. That, but that brings me back to that point that I made earlier about, you know, with all of this high tech technology, you know, they they want us to do more with less. But all of this crypto stuff is doing more because you need ever expanding storage space and hard drive space and computer processing power. So the move into digital is actually speeding up the acceleration of this energy yeah, I collapse. If, I don't, I'm not sure I buy the model that that's a massive resource consumer. It, it consumes a lot of servers, but you know, we're getting, the Moore's law is held up for quite a while. So I, I, think, I think we're heading that direction and, and we're also providing the capacity to do it simultaneously. So, I mean, if you look at that compared to, you know, how much fuel and resource we use just to run our trucking fleet in the country, it's a pretty enor enormous amount of resources. But I think you, know, you can make arguments that lithium is going to get harder to find and the lithium battery problem shows up. Uh, the solar panels, which I think are a, a bad joke, actually. I think the solar panels, they, they might be energy positive. You have to be very careful to bean count the energy because... Uh, I, and someone who tells you, no, you, you make money with solar panels, that's not subsidized. The question is, from start to finish, um, do you, is it a net positive for energy to make a solar panel? And, and it's a debatable topic. What that tells you, therefore, is that, that they're not an adequate replacement for fossil fuels. Because I'll tell you, no one debates that pulling a barrel of oil out of Saudi Arabia is energy positive. That's easy. You just suck it out of there and put it in a barrel, and you can run a lot of cars for a long time off that barrel. But, uh, you know, can you use solar power to, to create more solar power and, and power the world? It's very inefficient, in my opinion. And I think it's a, maybe we'll get there. But if, if that's our only choice, if they're right, we're running out of fuel, we, we, we are in a real race. Now, I think the climate change story... Um, I, three years ago, I believed it. Two years ago, I, I questioned whether the scientists who all signed off on it weren't just signing off because they're, they trust the science world. And then last year, I did a deep dive at urging my colleagues. I concluded that this, the climate change story, that the climate change story is, um, is, um, the climate change story is, is the crisis is a hoax. And what I found when I did this deep dive is I found an enormous amount of uh, conflicts of interest that were not about big oil. They were about big, big climate science. Now, we spend a trillion a year on climate change related stuff. That's the conflict. If climate change is fake, then that should all goes away. And, um, uh, and then I found, uh, you know, there's there's just lies everywhere you turn. They say, oh, no one who's got any credibility whatsoever, um, you know, is a denier of climate change. And the next thing you know, you can find probably two dozen Nobel Prize winning physicists all say this is a hoax. First, I thought they're going to say, I'm not quite sure. No, they say it's a bad hoax. The former head of the National Academy of Sciences said this may be the biggest hoax in history. Right. So that there's so if you're told no one with any credibility doubts it, that's the first big lie. There's massively prominent people who doubt who, who profoundly doubt it. Um, you know, you see pictures of starving polar bears are told that's because of climate change. And then you find out that the polar bear population has increased threefold since the 70s. And that maybe that starving polar bear had stomach cancer was was 75 years old and 
they got a picture of a polar bear in his last life. By the way, the day before I die, I'm going to look pretty pathetic too, probably. And, um, and so you, you, everywhere you turn, you find all sorts of lying and all sorts of shaping the narrative. And it's just, it's not science at all. It's not, what, what we're getting, by the time the information gets to us, it's, it's way too far from this real science. So you mix science and politics, you get politics, you don't get science. And so it's a, I think it's a hoax. They've lost me. They, they, I've, I've told, I don't even read it anymore because I, I have no interest in trying to find truth in a sea of lies. And, and, and it's interesting that you bring that up and with the narrative and the truth and the lies because, you know, many, many moons ago when I was at University of North Carolina, I studied abroad in Mexico and we were using Telnet for our email server. Well, I don't know if you remember Telnet. Well, that's yes, that's plain text. You know, totally unencrypted, totally unsecured. Like it wouldn't even fly in this in today's right. day and age. That's how I was doing my official emails with the school. But here's my point with that. You know, 20 years ago, you could find what you needed on the internet if you wanted to learn about something. You could learn about it. But now it seems like with every passing year, the information that you actually want is becoming impossible to find. And the narratives are just so tightly controlled now that just conducting research, you know, people used to say, don't surf the net, search the net. But, you know, it's getting harder and harder to do this. So so where is that leading to, Dave? Well, so a year ago, I had expressed grave concern over them listening to everything we do. And that now seems like a quaint concern to me. So I've come to terms with the fact that you and I are being, you know, archived in some NSA database, and, and I've I've come to terms with the idea that Google scrapes everything, and uh, you know, I, if we become an authoritarian state, that will be what is used against us. And, um, what has become much more prominent in my mind is is now not them worrying about what we say, but but them allowing us to say stuff. And so I think the censorship is unbelievable. Um, I think the uh, I think I think the, the the filtration of by major social media groups and by Google and stuff where with certain topics you you simply can't like before the uh, the rally yesterday the day before the rally if you went to Google Maps and you searched for the for the directions to get there that you they didn't give it to you Google would not give you the directions so that's a tiny little thing but you know if you there's there's topics that are dicey enough where you search them, you have to go through about ten or fifteen Google pages to start to get stuff. And yeah, you, know, you search some scandal of the Clintons or something, and the first couple of pages are all debunkings. And so, so I, I think the Supreme Court has fallen hopelessly behind. And I think it's I think they have to take a couple of these cases and rule what can't be done. And I don't think, for example, Twitter can boot you because you're a right winger. I don't think, uh, I, I think there's a lot of things that can't be done, but they're now so powerful that the only level it can be dealt with is the Supreme Court. And even that might not be possible because, because someone still has to rule in a court of law that they can't do it, even if the Supreme Court has already made the case, right? So, you know, the burying of the Biden laptop was was a great example. They 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 stuffed that so deep in the ground, and whether it's true or not, they buried it. Just, and, and the Mandalay Bay thing that you referenced earlier in the interview, they buried that, and you don't even hear oh, a word about that the anymore. Bay story is a truly an amazing yeah. story, too. Yeah, and and there's not a word about it anymore. Um, <laughs> Dave, last question here. You know, we're moving through winter, and I guess the election's over. I never, you know, thought that it was really going to be. I, I didn't think that Congress was going to rock the boat, so to say. Um, I also, by the way, I don't think it would have been a good thing. As much as I thought there was major fraud. And I'm not a big fan of of the the left. Um, to flip the election any time after would have been catastrophic. I think. Mm -hmm. I, I think in the game of capture the flag, they got our flag, and I think it was too late. And and I think if if we don't straighten out the election uh, protocols by 2024, then we've screwed the pooch. I'm I'm willing to throw Trump under the bus mentally and say. If you come up with something like maybe a blockchain-based voting system that, that's not, that, that can't be tinkered with, if we come up with that, I'm okay. If, if we're still doing crazy, batshit third world stuff in 2024, we're, we're, gonna, we're, we're a banana republic. Mm -hmm. so. 
Um, yeah, and and you know, watching some of the protests all over the United States last night, um, I was looking, and you know, one of the one of the live streams, like indie media, was from Colorado, and. We're there at the Banana Republic right now. You got pickup trucks with that are essentially tactical police carriers that have these exoskeletons built up on them where you basically got the police all tactical gear and everything riding on these pickup trucks ready to dismount and run or whatever it is that they do. But that's stuff you see in the third world or in Mexico, right? Um, so it's just like incremental, this, this, this authoritarianism creep, I guess, for lack of a better word. Um, but the last question here, Dave, is so right now, as we're moving through winter, what is on your radar the most? What, is, is there anything that like you're like focused in and honing in on like a hawk? Um, is, it, is it, you know, the rise of China that everybody's talking about? Or is it something with the pandemic and the lockdowns and the vaccine? Or is it the election or or protests and riots erupting again? Or, or what, what are you looking at as we move through winter, Dave? Well, in a nutshell, if I were to list the you know, sort of, if I can do this from memory, top five list of, of existential issues. When I say existential, I don't mean live or die, but rather thing, things that will cause the way we think we are to not exist potentially. Existential risk or the rise of authoritarianism in this country. I think we've become complacent about what, how, what got us here and what it takes to stay here. So I, th I, think, I think we're throwing that right under the bus. I, I watch compliance all over society. And, and people don't seem to even understand what they're giving up as they do this. Jonah Goldberg wrote a pretty good book a couple years ago that basically said, you got to keep reteaching every generation. We're not doing it. Uh, the big reset, of course, as I mentioned, uh, the markets, of course, as I mentioned, because I think they're I think they're more than two x overvalued. And at some point, I'm a believer that regression to the mean is a force of nature that can be diddled with, but it can't be precluded. So I think we will have a massive, massive um, uh, market reset, and and whether it's due to a, an inflationary disaster, a deflationary collapse. Um, I, I have one plot that I really like graphic where I show that you can either go straight down more than 50% or you can go straight across and just tread water while the GDP catches up and that'll take 35 years. You can angle your way down through a combination of time burning the clock and price and over I think it was uh, over 25 years you'll lose 16% of your, your your net worth that that gets you to the to the regress to the mean, by the way, which we're not talking about below the mean, which is where you have to spend some of your time, I'm told, by math. Yeah. And if the Fed gets the way they want us to angle upward, they want us to appreciate um, equities, they want us to appreciate somehow have gains and have the GDP just creep its way towards and that regression, you can get, a, I think, was a 25% total return over 50 years. And, and it sounds like, how, how can you be so pre precise? Well, I set a GDP curve at, at the same GDP growth as the 20th century, and I put us 2x overvalued, and I just said, okay, straight down 50%, straight across 35 years. It's a very easy, very easy graphic to understand. And so, uh, so I believe this is mandatory. And the path is not mandatory, and the timing is not mandatory, but the event eventually will take place. If it doesn't, we're in a terrible situation. So we've got equity valuations so high that they're priced to return sort of standard growth rates, maybe a couple of percent in perpetuity. Your bonds in a 60-40 portfolio are priced to return after inflation negative return. And the only question when you're a bond buyer is how many years do you not want to make money? And so you can go 10, 20, or 30. And going out on the curve is just the duration of no profit. And that's ignoring inflation. I think inflation could go nuts. I would, if we, a lot of people don't understand from 67 to 81, the market didn't go anywhere, but inflation was ripping and people, it's easy to forget that if you weren't living through it. And so in from 67 to 81, you didn't make a penny and to an investor nowadays, the idea of 14 years from now being nowhere is disturbing. But, um, but inflation took out 80%. So the idea being inflation adjusted 80% lower 14 years from now, that's, that's a staggering, it's a staggering number. And, uh, and so um, 
I worry um, the laptop is an important entity. And you go, well, but Biden's in office now, so it's irrelevant. No, not even close. Um, the laptop was brought up in a way that seemed pathetically incompetent during the election. They brought it up too late. They gave out tiny shards to the point where you weren't even positive it existed, although I am. I, too many credible people said, I saw the evidence, I saw the data, it's real. And, um, and the Biden campaign never denied it. They weren't saying this is fake. There's, because they know that it could be popped out on the table and said, here it is, dude, you lied. Um, and so the question is, what's the role if it, if it was played so poorly for the election? And you say, well, maybe they're incompetent. The alternative is it served a different purpose. And what would that be? Well, I came up with four models for that. One is the, the RNC saying, Joe, um, you're in the office, behave yourself. We've got the laptop. The second is the DNC saying, Joe, uh, it's time for you to step down. We, we want Kamala there now. Um, the Trump family could, could be saying, we've got the laptop, and as much as you want to send the DOJ after my family, if you do, we're going to destroy you. All right, we've got everything. And then the third, fourth party that's relevant is the Chinese. Now, they don't need the laptop because every, every person of any consequence who said a word in China has been recorded audio and video. Right? There's no doubt of that. And so Hunter, everything Hunter Biden ever did is on record in China. And so they don't need the laptop. They created the laptop. And, and so what it means now is we just went from the only president in about seven who was willing to try to stand up to China to a guy who's owned by China. And so we now are completely defenseless against China, if my premise is correct, which means we will never get a fair trade deal, which means the trade battles are off, right? So China, China just won monstrously. There's a video of one of Xi Jinping's right-hand men, which is so disturbing. It's in a documentary. It's Two thirds of the way through, but the guy stands up in front of an audience and he's talking about. He starts out, he says, We for many years have had control of the upper echelon of the US political elite. I'm going, What? He just admitted that they control our, our guys. And then he says, And then Trump got elected and we lost control. And he says, And when you want to get control, you just put out a wad of cash and the audience laughs. He says, if that doesn't work, you do another wad of cash. It's very straightforward. This is a guy talking to an audience. And he says, um, but people said, we're not powerful enough to deal with him. And you're going, so he was standing up to them, according to this guy. And then he says, um, and now Biden's in office. And the audience laughs. He says, we're OK now. So this guy basically, now why he said this so publicly, sometimes you go, you know, maybe that was like when, you know, Putin po poisoned someone with polonium, right? It's a way of saying, look, it's unambiguous, I did it. Or it's our CIA saying it's unambiguous, we did it, right? I mean, it, but it's, it's the sovereign state who assassinated the person. Um, so maybe that was their way of shooting a shot across our bow saying, behave yourselves, we own you. And so I worry about that. I think, I think we're defenseless against China economically now, and politically, everything. They own our White House. And there's nothing good can come of that. No, except for that creeping authoritarianism, which isn't good for anything at all. Right. So, Dave, um, best way to check out your work is, 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 is actually the best thing to do is just to follow you on Twitter, I guess, because like yeah, you say, when I have like guests. The pinned tweet, so David B. Column is my Twitter feed. The pinned tweet is my year in review. So, so if you follow me on Twitter. I have noticed a funny phenomenon, which I don't care, but it, it is weird. My follower count has refused to, to change for about six months now. I've got other friends on Twitter who are pretty big follower counts who say the same thing. So for, for years, it was almost formulaic. In fact, I thought it was. I thought they're, OK, keep giving this guy followers, because we, we need the dopamine to keep him coming back to Twitter and this and that. And, and then I noticed it wasn't moving. So I started monitoring it. And it hasn't moved. I mean, it, it's, it's um, I think I picked up a couple hundred followers in six months. On a daily basis, I can usually see about 40. But the total count just isn't going. Now, I don't need any more. 
Like, this is not me whining about not being famous enough. I, I was happier with one-tenth the number of followers because I didn't have people sniping at me. But, um, but there's a story here. There's something going on where Twitter is attempting to do something, and I don't know what it is. I know people who think Jack has lost control of the company, and, and I kind of have a sense of that. I, I, have, I can sign off on that model. Do you have hope for this parlor, and or are these just going to get co-opted in the end, too? Well, both, uh, in the sense that uh, there's two problems. One is everyone gets caught. The CEO of Gab started a free speech sort of forum, and, and he's being destroyed by the credit card companies. So if you try to send pay anything into Gab, uh, uh, Visa won't process it. Now, that's where the Supreme Court ought to come in. They'll say, no, you can't do that. That's you're suppressing free speech, right? Mm -hmm. He wrote a horror story. His whole family's under this blanket of coverage. Uh, so yes, yes, the powerful forces are making sure that no outliers, with the exception of Trump, for four years, no outliers can show up. Uh, they boot people off the social media. They suppress, you know, New York New York Post story on the on the um, on the Biden laptop got completely censored. Um, Possible alternatives to vaccination all over social media got squashed like a bug. I found out yesterday why. I didn't understand why beyond the fact that it's obviously um, the vaccine guys. There's a very deep, dark plot there. Um, and I'm not an anti-vaxxer. I'm an anti-vaccine industrial complexer. Um, it turns out to get emergency release of the vaccine, you, the, the law says you have to have, not only do you have to show efficacy, but you, you also have to have no alternative. And the law is very clear to state that there's no alternative. And so you can't have ivermectin or H, H, uh, H, HCQ um, working and then get emergency relief. And so that, I think, is why they relentlessly stepped on therapeutic treatments. I, by the way, recommend going to tractor supply and getting the horse paste, which you feed to horses, and make sure you get the one that has just ivermectin, not a composite of things. And, uh, or, or if your doctor will give it to you. I tried to get HCQ out of my doctor. He said, I can't prescribe it. New York State won't let me prescribe it. Why? It's been around for 75 years. People take it prophylactically when they go to Africa, but somehow they shut down the sales of HCQ, right? Oh. That's authoritarianism. That, that's a problem. And I've had docs say, oh, no, that's bullshit. I said, I'm telling you, you didn't look at the law. New York State has now made it illegal to prescribe HCQ. And, you know, so fuck you. So I actually, um, I actually um, got someone who said, here's a good overseas source, and I bought it. So I bought HCQ and Azithromycin. So I have both the uh, Zelenko procedure protocol and, and ivermectin in my medicine cabinet. And I recommend y'all do the same because if you get H, if you get um, COVID symptoms, what I do know is you want to get on that disease as fast as you can, because at some point it starts chewing up your organs and brain and stuff if you get a bad case. And so you do not want to sit around and wait till they they they, they need to take you to the hospital. So the second I think I have it, I mean I get tested twice a week too. So if I test positive, boom, down it goes. There are people I know who I, I, I think are credible who take um, ivermectin once a week prophylactically. Your dogs get it. It's one of the anti-worming meds. And it supposedly is phenomenal for a broad range of viruses. They've discovered, there's all sorts of clinical trials out there that are coming forward saying ivermectin works. Mm -hmm. and, and, and there's also clinical trials saying HCQ works. But the early ones were sandbagging it badly. And if you looked at it, they did them wrong. And you go, why would you blow the clinical trial? And the answer is, and I think this is pretty close to true, Bill Gates funds the entire global virology community. And he also funds the media. And he also funds companies who, who actually do stuff. Like, he gives money to companies that he owns shares in. Right? It's a very weird world that he's in. I think Bill Gates is is a sick bastard at this point. I think the obsession that built Microsoft has been directed to vaccination. I think he could pass a lie detector test thinking he's doing good, but I also think Goebbels could pass that lie detector test, so. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and Windows has become nothing more than adware anyway, and 
Microsoft Outlook is ransomware now because they won't even give you the whole screen unless you pay for the premium product. Yeah, uh, I get it through Cornell, so. <laughs> Dave, so, you know, sounds like we got authoritarianism coming up, um, but I guess the only thing we can do about it right now is just try and resist however we can in our own little ways and uh, understand what's going on so we can kind of get ahead and front run it. Any concluding thoughts there, Dave? Yeah, I'm going to give you one concluding thought. And I've been doing this for years, and you've read it, and you've seen it. Um, We're shut down when we start to, if you try to connect the dots, you are immediately referred to as a conspiracy theorist. Or if someone is proposing some idea that's outside the box, you yourself might be tempted to say, well, that's just conspiracy theory. I, I assert that men and women of wealth and power conspire. And, and as I've said on Twitter, uh, if you don't, then you're just a moron. And then I, I also assert that if you do, but you won't speak up, then you're a coward. So here's what I urge you all to do. When you hear someone say that's just a conspiracy theory, challenge them and say, do you believe that people don't conspire? And if they do, stop saying that. It's being used to shut down alternative ideas. So I wear the conspiracy theory label with as a badge of honor. And maybe I'm in a unique position where someone can say, well, we know he's not a dumb bastard. You know, so I've got I've got the credentials that I can hide by me. But just when someone says that, stop them in their tracks and say, wait a minute. So is there a problem with the possibility that people conspire? And then when they when they come up, there's a bunch of arguments they come up with, like, well, you know, for that to happen, it would require keeping a big secret. And I go, no, it wouldn't. Now, just wrap your brain around the idea of what happens when something goes bad. And what happens is the media just mows you down. Right? So when the Biden laptop showed up, they just denied it existed. Every media outlet, with the exception of a couple of guys on Fox, said no. It's just right-wing conspiracy theory. Right? And that's what they'd say. And so, so, so you don't have to pull off a clever conspiracy at all. You just have to have the media just make sure they don't. So, so, the, so conspiracies are not kept secret. The response to them is controlled. If you can keep that under control, how many of us think Kennedy was assassinated by something more than us? Well, probably, I don't know, 70% is my guess. So what? What, what does that do? Let's say everyone in the world th thought that the, 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 the shootings in Vegas were not what they appeared to be. So what? If there's nothing to be done about it, whatever was the purpose, they, they won. And so, so wear the conspiracy label with honor. Challenge people who throw that out and say, look, you're trying to shut me down. I'm not a big fan of that. Would you please explain why you think that's a valid thing to say? Challenge that. And if you say, I am not a conspiracy theorist, but check yourself. Say, look, dude, you just said you're not a conspiracy theorist. You're about to present a conspiracy. The but means you're about to. Stop saying you are not a conspiracy theorist. Start saying you are. You pick them carefully, you choose. Yes, I agree, there are not all the night aliens in Area 51, but yes, I also agree that the Clinton Foundation is a crime syndicate. And they kill people when they get out of line. And Jeffrey Epstein has a massive web of connections which we're not being told about by mainstream press because they're powerful people. And the Jeffrey Epstein worked for the Mossad and Jiz Max will work for the Mossad, and her father's the most famous Israeli spy of all time. There's books written about her father. And, and start embracing alternative ideas and think about them before you shoot them down. And just because they rattle your worldview a little bit doesn't mean you should denounce them. Grow a pair. That's my advice. Grow a pair. There you have it. There you go, folks. Grow a pair, and that means that... If you're a female, you wear that badge of conspiracy label with pride. Dave, I'd like to thank you for joining us again on Silver Doctors. Thank you. <laughs>